Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Holy Spirit Academy for our faculty lecture series. Tonight, we're very pleased to invite our faculty member, Mr. John Lipper, a theology and humanities teacher, uh, to lecture us on liturgy and leisure. Let us please begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and we can know the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O oh God, who dares to start the hearts of thy people, and by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in that same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in this consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Andrew. Pray for us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, please help me welcome Mr. John Lover. Rather than very uniform, 
loop, 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 much more like a sort of discordant rhythm that very easily throws us off of any pattern at all. And so I want to take us now from a, not, from a fictional nightmare at Kamazakh to a non-fictional nightmare. This nightmare actually happened. This is during World War II. There was a man named Victor Frankl, an Austrian man, who was imprisoned in Terezin, Terezin South, the concentration camp in uh, the Czech Republic. And while he was there, he would have seen a doorway much like this, a doorway that says, work shall set you free. A different kind of a rhythm, a different kind of a pulse, and a different kind of a nightmare for him in the concentration camp. And he noticed something very, very interesting. He noticed that rhythm also had a place in the concentration camp, and it decided not only how work was done, but who lived and who died. But it wasn't the, the Nazi rhythm, the rhythm of Nazi movements or Nazi orders. It was the rhythm of life of the individual prisoners, the sense of a purpose, the sense of a method to their lives among prisoners. So if you and you and you were all prisoners at Terezin, Victor Frankl would have watched you as he, as he was a fellow prisoner along with you. And you would have noticed that you had a lack of a sense of rhythm, a lack of a sense of purpose, of context to your life. You were very likely, he discovered, to die and to die soon. If you, however, had a strong sense of the meaningfulness of your actions, the rhythm, the meaningful rhythm in which your life took place, even if you were being yelled at or brutalized at one moment and, and doing backbreaking labor the next, if you could see the context, you could sense the rhythm, you would survive. And this led him to propose a very unique and very important school of psychology, which is known today as the third school of Austrian psychology. And it's called logotherapy. Logotherapy, from the Greek word logos, logos, which means order. Right? And so the therapy of order, that there was a sense that man needed to have a meaning to his life in order to keep on living. Aristotle would have agreed. He said, man, uh, man acts for an end. In other words, to be human means to make intentional choices and to not make intentional choices, to not have a sense of the purposefulness of our day-to-day -day activities is to, to live a less than human life, a life that is devoid of meaning, um, and that our ways to be let go of. Victor Frankl noticed three different things through his pursuit of logotherapy, three different ways that people would seek after meaning, and these are worth paying attention to for a moment, asking ourselves how we uh, find the rhythm, find the purpose of our own lives. He noticed that, number one, there was a, a version of finding the meaning in your life through seeking, uh, seeking meaningful pursuits. So this is very important to distinguish from the second one. Number one is seeking a transcendental meaning through a pursuit. For instance, seeking beauty and doing it through art. Right? Just because I'm trying to paint a masterpiece doesn't mean that my painting is beautiful, but the act of pursuing is itself a way of absorbing the meaning of my life, of affirming the meaning of my life. I'm pursuing the thing that gives my life meaning, one of the transcendentals, truth, goodness, or beauty, right? that are available all around us that we need to seek out. Number two, after pursuit, there was deeds. While I may pursue a painting and, and more or less fail to have a beautiful painting, a deed that is beautiful, a deed is, that is beautiful can be very simple, and it can be achieved all at once. It could be an embrace of a lonely person. It could be um, an act of love that in and of itself encompasses and incarnates the meaning of my life. I express it. I don't just seek it. I also express what I've sought. That was the second way that he found people embodying the meaning of their lives and really affirming it. Number three is also extremely interesting, maybe the most interesting, and that is to find the meaning of one's life through suffering precisely. Through suffering. Which sounds weird, right? Because normally we want to avoid that. And if you torture an animal enough, it will die. If you show it nothing but abuse, and its life is nothing but a cycle of abuse, it will die. But a human person can actually go into suffering and find meaning in it if, and this is the big if, if the person embraces that suffering willingly for the sake of a higher goal. This showcases something that Victor Frankl, his local therapy, uh, illustrates very clearly, which is that man 
is made not just for physical ends, not just for physical satisfaction, but for spiritual satisfaction, a sense of spiritual purpose. And if he has that sense of spiritual purpose, he can endure a great deal of physical abuse. And a good example of the way that suffering can be used to discover meaning was uh, Victor Frankl's clinic, an elderly man who was himself a uh, practitioner of psychology, came in after having lost his wife of many years. They had been very close, very much in love, and he was heartbroken, grief stricken. He didn't know what to do. And he came to Victor Frankl and he says, what can you do for me? What can you say to me? And Victor Frankl looked at him and did not uh, tell him to go and get a beer or take a hot bath, take a nap, it'll be fine. He said, how would your wife have felt if you had died first and she had lived? Weird question. And the man said, she would have wished she would have been the same place I am, maybe even worse. And Victor Frankl said, that's your sacrifice for her. But embracing that sacrifice means that you embrace the suffering that goes along with it. And the man calmly looked at him right in the eyes, shook his hand quietly, and went out. That was what he needed. Victor Frankl said, man, here we go, man can endure almost any how as long as he has a why, as long as he has a purpose for that suffering. Okay. So, so far we've got rhythm is important. The rhythm and the purpose of our lives, the sense of purpose in our actions is important. It makes us fully human. We have two natures, the spiritual and the material. One more word on that is important to know. If we did not have a spiritual nature, if we didn't have a spiritual thing to live for, material suffering would be unbearable. Because if material was all there was and we were materially suffering, life would just be plain old bad. Unless man has something to dignify that suffering, there is no point to life in its imperfections, especially material life. Let's take a look then, going from there to modern society, and ask ourselves, if this is, oh, that was supposed to go to the slide about loss. That's an old woman by the grave. How are we doing with our own sense of purposefulness and purposelessness? If we are not finding our, our rhythm in life through acts of suffering, through acts of uh, um, direct love, and seeking out the transcendentals, where are we finding our sense of identity instead? accessible at almost every time of the day, right? 
every time of the day. So our rhythms are fragmented. And what is our twofold solution? You know, twofold solution to this fragmentation of society. This is supposed to be a depressed person holding the phone. That is, it's so beautiful, you see? He's seeing himself in a screen, on a screen, on a screen. <laughs> oh, it's so meta, right? That's so deep. This is where we are. Rhythm. Okay, so what is the twofold solution to this? Leisure and liturgy. Leisure and liturgy? That's a, what does that mean? What is leisure? Well, let me tell you what is not. First of all, I can see you right there. You're thinking leisure is me looking through my contacts on my phone while slouched over on my couch, right? And the moment that I can take away from schoolwork. No, wrong, thanks for playing. That's not leisure, right? <laughs> leisure is, um, leisure is uh, when I finally am able to break away and get some gasoline for my vehicle, which is almost out, right? In preparation for tomorrow. I use my leisure time to prepare for tomorrow. <sighs> leisure, go leisure. Production leisure time. No, wrong again. Three strikes. <laughs> but I'm not going to induce any more anxiety than we already have in our culture. We won't strike out. Leisure is freedom from external constraint. English, please. Leisure is freedom from the needs of survival, the material needs of survival. What is it that you need to survive? Clothing. Thanks for taking that first step here tonight. All right? <laughs> Food, sleep, right? shelter, these are all necessities. Right? If you are taking a break from your need for those things, and for those secondary things like the job that help you to get them, all the utilitarian or secondary ways of getting the things that you need in your life, if you are able to step away from them and simply be, no longer chase after life in some of its particulars, but just experience it as a gift, a sheer gift, Allow it to be what it is, and allow you to be yourself in it. That is the leisure. We get very little leisure today. If I wanted to take leisure on my way home, I would be shouted at, and even if I turned off my phone, my goal was all the way back. We have very little sense of allowing nature itself just to be nature. We always want to put a message over it, to get something out of it. But leisure, leisure is a celebration. This is what we normally refer to when we talk about stopping and smelling the roses. And it requires a stepping back. You might think, well, okay, I'll just, I'll just stop like midway through talking this way. Leisure. Not quite. It could be, it could be a stroke. <laughs> but leisure is when you actually allow the world, being itself, to be celebrated. To say, I am alive, and life is given to me. Life is good, and that means you have to be able to see life as a whole, and not just as a bunch of particulars rushing at you. And you know this, you know this, if you've woken up, your little head is coming off the pillow, and you're like, Mr. Lopez test us today, I was supposed to study for a week, I didn't know, they no, 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 the particulars of life are flying at you. Ah, oh, breakfast, ah, oh, I should put my shoes, on. Oh. right? And there's a sense, and adults do it too. Oh my gosh, today is the dentist appointment, and oh, 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 and, and more and more things. We, we have a, a real problem enjoying life for what it is, and I want you to treat yourself for a moment as if you were your own kid. It's weird. But imagine a kid on a playground. Imagine a kid on a playground enjoying playtime, just enjoying being alive, enjoying the world as it is. This is leisure. I want you to now imagine that kid trying to figure out in the middle of the playground with his head in his hands how he's going to play or pay the phone bill. That is not leisure, right? when we're worried about how to do life rather than that life is. Um, that's when you stop being leisurely. Okay, so we've talked about some of the different things that leisure is and some of the things that it is not. But it is important to say one final thing about it. Leisure, as wonderful as it is, is only half the picture. Because leisure is a freedom, but it's only a freedom from. It's a freedom from the dictatorship of mundane, earthly, grubby things that allow you to stay alive. Some of our shelters are brighter than others, but Saturday's coming, so we have both. Right? <laughs> so leisure is not just free, leisure is just freedom from. But the problem with just freedom from is that 
we often don't, in that time when we have leisure, as we've already known, there's so many different distractions, especially in the modern age, that we quickly rush to fulfill, to fill ourselves in that, in that empty space with something that is not truth, goodness, and beauty at its highest degree. The thing for which we want, the thing that will fulfill us spiritually and materially, we don't go for it. What do we do? Instead, just like when we're hungry and we first come into the kitchen, we grab the cheese pops, right? We grab YouTube, we grab Facebook, we grab Twitter, and three hours later, we are not fulfilled. Surprise. We don't do leisure well as a culture. Maybe you're better than some than most of us. I would I would guess, but I'm not gonna flatter you, you can flatter yourself. Okay. So then if leisure is not the answer. Leisure can quickly devolve into this, which by the way is my Thanksgiving, family Thanksgiving. <laughs> if leisure can be turned into license and selfishness, and grubbiness, and dirtiness, and things that are not the glory that for which we are made, what to do? How can we gratify our deepest desires, both spiritual and physical, material and spiritual, and yet not devolve into selfishness? St. Paul is no stranger to this problem. He says, oh, who will rescue me from this body of death? The thing that I want to do, I don't do. The thing that I don't want to do, I always end up doing. Right? Why do we always fight on Thanksgiving? Why do I always go back to the cheese puffs? I knew I shouldn't have gotten on YouTube. Three hours later, here I am. Procrastination. Why do we do this? Because we need literature. <sighs> Mr. Lippert, are you telling me that going to church all the time will solve all my problems? No. Liturgy here means public Worship, public work, and it's a specific type of public worship and public work. In the old days, in ancient Greece, it used to mean like a play. Mrs. Morris would put on a play for all of the, the people at Holy Spirit Academy, and she would pay for it, and that would be her act of, of liturgy, lit, liturgy, there you go, I don't know Greek, right? And that would be her public worship. Or am I equipping the ship for Miss Northern School? She would buy us a ship, and we would all sail away on it, and that would be her act of public worship. But for the Catholic Church, for us today in the 21st century as Catholics, the liturgy that I'm talking about refers primarily to three things. That's the sound of three things coming out of the One, two, three. The Eucharist, the liturgy of the hours. So liturgy of the Eucharist, liturgy of the hours, and liturgy of the word, or in other words, the Bible, sacred scripture. These particular things are extremely important because what they do is they make us part of something which is larger than ourselves. When we talk, when we celebrate the liturgy as Catholics, we come into a community. We come into a community of the faithful, people who have been made part of the body of Christ. And So liturgy is really important because it brings us outside of ourselves. In ourselves, we're a very small package to wrap up in ourselves. And we're not fulfilled by our own uh, graspings and physical and material uh, satisfaction. So we're called to something transcendent, as we said, truth, goodness, and beauty. And because they're spiritual realities, it means they're infinite. They're infinite. We have a spiritual hunger that cannot be satisfied by a Cheeto or a cell phone or a like on Facebook. It literally has to be infinite source of truth, goodness, and beauty that's going to fulfill us spiritually. That means we need to be able to get out of what we ourselves can physically, materially grasp in our own material bodies and by our own material efforts. We need to become part of something larger, a system, a rhythm, a purpose, which takes us up and makes us part of the thing we see. It has to be received as a gift, right? It has to be received in a moment of leisure. We can't earn it for ourselves, but it has to be something bigger than ourselves, too to be a gift of God. Thank goodness that we have the church. Let's just walk really quickly through these. The word is the word of God made like the words of man. The word of God made like the words of man. So that means Mr. Mueller in his scribblings, in his study, working on the next great American novel, the divine word, Jesus himself has made himself one with man and has actually poured himself into the human language so that he can be expressed through human words, verbs, participles, whatever those are. 
nouns, right? All of these things. The word of God has made the word of man. And so while he has met us in our desires, in our physical and spiritual desires, our very human experience, he's also made us part of his own divine horizons. He's made, us po uh, made it possible for us to grasp pure, transcendental truth, goodness, and beauty in union with him. How do we do it? By accessing him through the liturgy of the word. He meets us halfway. What is the liturgy of the hours? The temporal experience of man. Here. Now I'm here. Change occurred. Right there, there. You were a witness to time. God saw me in both instances at the same, he sees it all infinitely at the same time. But God makes himself a sanctifier of time, right? The hours of man are sanctified by the word of God. We pray the Psalms. The church keeps vigil at different times of the day and sanctifies the whole human experience of time. Again, Making man part of a community that's not only worldwide, but actually heavenly. There's a heavenly liturgy that we're entering into in the liturgy of the hours, in the liturgy of the word, and also especially in the liturgy of the Eucharist, in which God has not just taken our time or our words, but has actually taken the most mundane, the most humble elements of material experience, and he's made them into his body and his blood. And he's invited us by that bridge to actually become one with him. He, he's taken us up into himself with the appearances of bread and wine. And this is, this is something which is pretty awesome. So I'm going to beg your pardon for just one moment. I'm going to draw a really bad drawing. being made in six steps. And they're poetic steps. God makes the, the light and the darkness, and then he later fills them with the sun and the moon. He makes the waters of the sea and the air and the sky, and then he later fills them with birds. There are the birds. The birds and the fishes. And he, and he makes dry land in the midst of the waters. He's, he's totally constituted the earth at this time, and he fills it last with people, which we all agree that we were. So that means he made us. And he's still at the very end of creation. He's made us the pinnacle of his creation. But, wait, there's another day. And in that day, that final day when he reveals what we're made for, what the purpose of our life is, what the rhythm of our life is supposed to be, this seven-day rhythm, he says that on the seventh day, it's time to rest. And by rest, we have the fulfillment of all desire, the fulfillment of the purpose of every of every one of the days, every other aspect of creation, including our own creation, has been summarized in the Sabbath. Wow. What do we do on the Sabbath? We celebrate the liturgy, the liturgy of the Eucharist, which literally takes all of creation, including ourselves, and unites it with the person of Jesus Christ, and we enjoy perfect communion, perfect rest on that day. That is the answer to how to keep our leisure from getting selfish is to make it liturgical. You're like, well, Mr. Lillard, you've told me everything you've told me. You told me that I'm supposed to make my leisure liturgical, but like, what am I supposed to do? Like, next time I grab a cheetah, like, offer it up? <laughs> yes, do so. Why? Our Lord says, go out on the earth and fill and subdue it. He also says to his church that when we go to Mass, we are supposed to be full, active, and conscious participants in the liturgy of the Mass. In other words, Remember that in public, that was part of public worship? That's you. You're part of it. So that means it's your priesthood that's also being offered up. When you were baptized, you're baptized. A priest, a prophet, and a king in Christ. And although we have ministerial priests who, acts, who act on our behalf at the head of the congregation, when they offer up that bread and the wine, they offer up our entire lives. Every sacrifice that you have to unite with that sacrifice is united with it. Your entire life has become fused with the liturgy. It's going to lift it up. What does this do to our sense of leisure? Right? That's the real question. We're trying to find a, a, a method to keep our leisure from becoming selfish. How does this solve the problem of Cheetos and YouTube? It's solved it by saying that every moment when we think we're left only to material, 
physical priorities, a physically dominated world and a physically dominated purpose, we have the option of giving thanks courtesy of our spiritual priesthood in the world and our ability to unite our actions and our sufferings with the sufferings of Christ and uh, in thanksgiving to Christ for the gift of being alive. We have a chance to offer them up as spiritual sacrifices. For the old man, that spiritual sacrifice was enough to allow him to endure the suffering of his wife, of his, the suffering uh, that came from losing his wife. If you saw your sufferings, your boredom, as, a, as being in connection with Christ, what could you not suffer? If you had a how, if you had a why to go along with your how. But that also brings us to the pleasure aspect of it. And we're almost done. So if you're, if you're, if you're feeling like you're about to use your leisure elsewhere, the line is coming. <laughs> the beautiful thing about the liturgy, the church's liturgy, is that because it encompasses all of our actually represents our human passions, it represents our human struggles, and it unites, it gives them all a place with the divinity, it gives them an access, a bridge to the divinity, through the human, uh, the human nature of Jesus Christ. The person of Jesus Christ became flesh, so that no part of your life was going to be a part of the divine. The only question then is, how are we using our science? And this is a really, a really hard question for us to answer, right? How are we using our science? Are we allowing God, the heart of God, the heart of God, which is so like the human heart, that speaks in human words and in human time, that sanctifies everything in creation for us, so that we're able to offer that as a gift and a sacrifice of grace to Him. Do we allow His heart beating through our lives to set the rhythm and our sense of identity? Or do we allow scrabbling for a buck or struggling after more material, uh, more material priorities to set the pace of our life? God has made creation good. He's made shelter good. He's made clothing good. He's made all the aspects of life good. But he's set us on top of the world to be its priests, not to be its slaves. And when we lose leisure, when we lose liturgy, we lose that. So, I think that, with that in mind, I will not just drop the mic, but I will open up the questions. be a finger wagging thing like you guys aren't the church it up enough if i can see you sinners right over there youtubers you're a youtuber aren't you that's not what this is about but this is saying we have a call to live a transcendent life meaning that right now mrs isel could be like doing saintly sitting right now right this this part of your life is like totally off up right now and united with christ what happens when we take our leisure and we don't unite it to christ this is an example of something that should above all United Fruit, because this is a holiday, a peasant holiday, by Brugel, a painter, sometimes called Brugel the Peasant, because he loved painting peasants in real life, doing real things. He was not, he was not like a, a frou-frou guy. He was very real. And he was showing all these peasants running to dance in the square on, the, on this feast of Our Lady. It's a holy day. It's a holiday. It's a leisure day. It's a liturgy day. But their focus is so much on the dance that they are actually passing you if you look really hard on the tree, and you probably have to look this up on the internet um, to actually see it. There's a very dim portrait of Our Lady, a sign of Our Lady, that's hung up there like to be venerated. It's her feast day. And they're like, whatever, let's go to the dance. And they run right by it. And it's so, it's, so it's very sly satire. And he has a couple of these peasant, uh, these peasant uh, festival paintings where he shows peasant life in its sort of earthiness, which is kind of kind of joyous, right? It's kind of nice. I like being Catholic. We like being able to drink beer and smoke cigars and do all this stuff that celebrates being alive physical creatures, right? And he shows that without a sense of holiness in the way we celebrate, even holy days, what happens is abuse. And instead of lifting our earthly experience up to heaven, 
as a sacrifice, we actually degrade our humanity. And you'll see, he's actually got an allegory for at least four capital sins, four deadly sins in his painting. Lust. <laughs> Gluttony or intemperance, right? This guy is so drunk that while I'm trying to reach out and grab another, grab another guy's hand, he's actually smacking the guy next to him in the face. And he's angry. This is also, there's a peacock feather, it's a little hard to see because it's dark, for pride. It's a little symbol for pride. And so Bruegel, while showing us this good old rowdy vessel, like, oh, why can't we just go back to the good old days when life was simple and we live nice and earthy? And he's saying, it's not what it seems. This could go dark places, not because humanity is bad, because it's so good, it's made for heaven, it's not made to stay on earth. And if you don't take advantage of using your leisure time to focus on the truly the good and the beautiful, you actually get pulled down into the earthly and the hellish. Does that make some sense? Are you satisfied? Okay. Other questions? revolution and how they tried to change and disrupt that rhythm, and can you speak to that at all? Yeah, that's a great question. Or comment. Yeah. So in the French Revolution, they were so hateful of the church and its influence on the people that uh, they decided to rewrite the calendar. They wanted to start it over at year zero from the year of the revolution. So if you go down to the, the catacombs of Paris, you'll see inscribed on the wall, like, the year zero. Like, wow, the Romans built really great sewers. And you're like, no, that was the French. They're just starting over at year zero. But they, in addition to starting the year over, they also tried to make uh, different times and festivals. They just made up reasons to have holidays. And they would make them like, the festival of reason. And uh, they would try to make sure that people operated by like a 10 hour day and a 10 day week. And they wanted to make sure that people's entire um, earthly rhythm that would have been set by the divine, that the seven days of creation that we referenced earlier, was completely destroyed so that man no longer had a sense of what his purpose was. The government would define his purpose for him. And Joseph Pieper writes about this in his book, In Tune with the World, A Theory of Festivity. He argues that such people become increasingly less capable of uh, really celebrating a festival at all. Because when you tear away life from its divine meaning, it's divine goodness, but you're left with is only usefulness. Usefulness to the state, to your neighbors. And the idea of a festival then, a celebration like a state-run festival, really becomes only an excuse to launch off a bunch of fireworks, destroy a bunch of things, and, and not be productive for a day. Which really, in the long run, becomes meaningless and actually anti-state. So it becomes not only harder to be truly festive, it actually becomes an absurdity to be festive if um, you take out the divine meaning other questions? I was afraid the seniors would get me. They've been reading on Joseph Peter and happiness and contemplation like all Thanksgiving. I was like, oh, I get it. Um, I'm just wondering, I'm guessing that since you're speaking about this topic, it's something that you have already integrated into your own life. Or I'm giving to <laughs> perhaps. And so um, I just wanted to know, uh, you know, have you seen benefits of this in your own life? And or do you have practical suggestions for people to begin trying to integrate uh, these ideas into their leisure time aside from holding their Cheeto and not taking out lessons? <laughs> Besides, but including, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, what a great question. Um, I am a fellow pilgrim on this journey, and I need to be farther behind than you, but I'm, I've got my eyes very firmly set on the goal, which is to live a life of obedience and awe at home, and especially recently, that's been bearing a lot of fruit. The obedience to a liturgical rhythm, which is not my selfishness, allows me to experience a different kind of transcendent joy and peace than I normally would in my lack of grasp by my own human ability. And um, the awe, that sort of childlike wonder that comes from knowing that you're taken care of, and then the ability to experience life without that stress, that comes when I'm obedient. And so I would really, really, really highly recommend, by all means when God says, open your mouth and I will fill it, be still and let me God, um, take a holy day of rest, um, that take him at his word, because it's bearing, even in my very imperfect life, it's bearing great fruit already, and I'm happy 
I say that God hasn't given me much of a choice because I am, um, I find it harder and harder to cope at all when I don't. I find it very, very hard to work on Sundays now without actually getting extremely stressed. It's like cognitive dissonance. It's like um, trying to walk through a, one of those uh, paintings that doesn't have perspective. You know, like, whoa, no, I'm something too me, you're one thing, you're nothing, nothing works anymore. There's a sense of like not understanding how my life works when my purpose is gone, my rhythm is gone, when I violate it. Um, so it's, it's sort of a blessing that he's shown it to me, but if I violate it, it's like a very clear violation of my sense of purpose. I have kind of a heavy question, so I don't, I don't know if it's going to make a lot of sense, but um, in the liturgy, you find the unity of the cosmic and the historical, and this is an idea that, that um, uh, Pope Benedict talks about, uh, that, that um, in some ways the liturgy is oriented towards the affirmation and the completion of the whole cosmic order, um, but it's also, and very concretely, a, a reference to the order of history and tradition. And so it's not only forward-looking and embracing of everything, but it's also sort of narrowly embracing a, a tract of revelation that is, was very specifically and uniquely laid out with the Jewish people. And if you take away either of those, the liturgy loses its full meaning. So like, for example, if you take out the historical element, you lose the notion of sacrifice and of priesthood. And then all of a sudden you don't have an offering. And so then what is the work? And if you remove the cosmic part, then you lose the, the way in which man himself can be united with God. That You lose the transcendence. And you also lose mercy. Um, so my question is, um, uh, how does that relate to uh, the liturgical mindset that you're proposing as a model for leisure? How does the historic and cosmic tie into that? Sorry, I don't think it's a bad question. I think it's a really good question. It may be such good questions beyond me to answer with great authority, but I will say that there's a really fun story in the Greek mythology called uh, the story of Theseus and Procrustes. And Procrustes has this bed that everyone has to fit on, and if they don't fit on it, if they're too tall, they'll saw part of their leg to make sure that they fit, and if they're too short, they'll stretch them out to the right length. And it's a sort of, oh, it's a one-size-fits-all bed. Yeah, well, in one way, yeah. Theology, uh, the liturgy, the liturgy, the divine liturgy, is a one-size-fits-all uh, liturgy, which is interesting because it does come to a very unique people, the, the Jewish people, and to a very particular set of historical circumstances. And God is very particular about the measurements and, and the kinds of stuff, the kind of materials that they're going to have in the temple. And we're told that the temple is this image of creation. Even its dimensions are symbolic of the structure and the rhythm of creation. And the Jewish people are its safeguards. And so what does it mean to inherit a uh, a liturgy from the Jews it means that God has literally meant a liturgy for all of humanity, for all time. A one size actually fits all, actually gives people true human freedom um, message through the Jews and that we inherited. Um, and that's a pretty crazy thing. And that the Catholic Church has been entrusted with that liturgy, like she's been entrusted with the sacrament of the Eucharist, despite all of our failings, and the sacrament of reconciliation, and like gifts of grace that are so mind boggling that we could never have earned them. Um, in some ways, it is very beautiful to see that all this history, um, God has used also for his purposes to unfold this plan. St. Paul says of the Jewish people, everything that's happened to them, even historically, has, has happened for a benefit. Even allowing them to fall from grace at times, even their infidelities are used for our instruction. So I find that just to be a marvel of grace, and that's the best I can do. Other questions, comments? Could you speak a little about the role of recreation in this and its distinction from leisure, especially as an overworked culture? I feel like a lot of people get stuck at recreation if they can't even begin that. Racy things if you want to about recreation, especially sports, and especially sports on Sunday, you know, and the notion of whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. In general, recreation, if you look at the word, means recreation. It renews you. You're a physical creature as well as a spiritual creature, and it, it's a beautiful thing to enjoy the full, healthy use of both, and to give thanks and praise to God for it. And so the notion of recreation on Sunday, um, I haven't found anything um, per se wrong about it. 
think it's possible to abuse recreation to the point where it's no longer recreative, but it's actually destructive and deceitful. Like we make it an idol of our own. We make it define us. Like that we look to ESPN for our answers about what's really important. And, um, and it's, it is amazing. Like I sometimes, I sometimes pass through. Um, I have a, a relative who's a very, very avid sports fan, and I have absolutely no judgment on him because I don't know what God is using for in his life. But I do watch sometimes, and like, my gosh, these people are speculating heatedly about what the Seahawks will look like three years from now. I'm like, I'm not sure what the world exists three years from now. And they're arguing about whether the Seahawks will have a good draft pick in three years. And like, we've gotten really far. If, and if you get sucked into that word, it becomes, it becomes more of the rhythm of your life than the sense of the divine. I can see it being a problem, but I, I have a hard time getting either a blanket, you know, blanket, no frills, condemnation, or affirmation. But I'm, I'm pretty glad for recreation. I'm one of those, I think St. Augustine says, if you're one of those people who doesn't need recreation, you just like work at a desk, good for you. But other people need it, and it's your duty to make sure that you can get it, because it's part of being human. And I think Benedict, um, the founder of monasticism, he would agree that it's important for the sake of the strong as well as the weak to have a balanced life with recreation as well. Other questions, comments, thoughts? So I guess I was just wondering, like, why were, why did you decide to do this presentation? What was, what, what was, well, where did you get the idea? Was it you were wondering about um, fulfillment in your own life, and that led to leisure, which led to liturgy, or is this an idea that's already out there? You don't know, really, or are you name dropping? It was your mom. <laughs> your mom asked me if I would if I would consider. I was I was thinking it was something completely different. I can't remember what I was trying to write. I was going to write about something cool, but it was not this. And um, your mom was like, "What about what about rhythm of rest and uh, liturgy and leisure?" I'm like, yes, yes, that would be good. So you can you can thank or blame your mother. But it is it is something that doesn't treat me. Yeah, it's like I like the fact that I have to breathe out and in, and then it's natural to me. I can actually willingly consent to, and that's a large part of my out of the holiness is saying yes to God very consciously every Sunday and then getting a chance to bring in my everyday life into that sacrifice and like letting the whole thing be sanctified. It's super cool. It's super cool. It's like one of those like like superhero powers, like a, like a weird amoeba, like a reach on my arm and like it just covers my part of it. And I get to say yes to more and more of it every day until one day I get a fully sanctified man busting things up. <laughs> Okay, we finally got the seniors. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Keller. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Keller, who would have guessed? <laughs> um, okay, so I was thinking about this. You said that um, it was something like recreation. I forget the exact word. What uh, was the word? Recreation. Recreation. Uh, recreation. And in a way that's imitating God, right? Because he's the creator of all. Um, so I was curious what um, you more um, fulfilling possible. Whether it be to recreate something like um, whether it be artwork, artwork, like creating something new coming in that process that you're talking about, or whether it be contemplating, um, like you're saying about this particular, um, whether that's just like taking a walk in the woods, contemplating God's goodness, and contemplating our life, like really realizing that, um, and, and not necessarily producing anything, not really creating anything, but just taking things in and as they are. Which one have more um, merit, I suppose, for um, rest? Listen carefully. I don't know. But I will say this play is one of my favorite things in the world, and I think it has a large uh, part to do with wonder, and it has a lot to do with gratitude and trust, and those are some of the spiritual gifts that I can identify. The notion of, of a saint who's in the world, who can love people but do so without clinging, like clinging to them like possessions. There's, and to a large extent, there's like a sort of a game and a celebration that goes on. And I find that to be a magnificent part of the when you see somebody who's lovingly engaged in the world, who's also free from taking it too seriously. 
And um, I do really like the, there's a, a verse, I think it's in Genesis, one of the prophets talking about the whales. I think it's Joey. He's talking about <laughs> the whales and the seas that God made to play with. And um, I think that's a wonderful thing that we can celebrate that creation is. So whether, whether you do that um, daydreaming as you, as you wait for your ride, or whether you do that by like, trying to build something out of Kraft macaroni and cheese noodles, or, um, or whether you're copying the Mona Lisa um, with uh, Mr. Men's Huber, I, I think the sense of wonder and gratitude would probably be the greatest qualities I would Would you agree with me that? Nope. Five by no, uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> that you are kind of striving for an aspect of this in your life, like just from knowing you in your everyday life. There are things that may be like just work and such, but that's something that I've always noticed in you that you use like imagination and just a kind of sense of whimsicality, whimsicalness to um, kind of raise up every day. Like even on Wednesday before school in the art room when you're trying to like, think of a story to connect all the different paintings. Just like those little things that are uh, giving life more, uh, just the yeah, best. Thank you, Miss Norton. Cool. So, yeah, would you agree with me that that is kind of an aspect of this um, perspective on life? Yes, yes, I would. Um, that has a lot to do with my not liking, like to be, my not liking to be told what to do with addicted. I mean, it's, it's uh, I'm catching it. Um, I don't like being told by the world that the world is boring when it's actually not, and that I know that life is drab and there's a real meaning when it's actually not. And it's so easy to fall into that. I think when people like Peter Pan talk about like, oh, we'll never grow up, we'll never grow up, the adults, the boring ones, they're the models of the world, right? <laughs> they don't see the magic, right? But that's really what we're talking about. It's not because adults actually see, oh, the world is cynical and hopeless, and you guys just don't realize that. Adults have actually, in the grown-up sense, in that sense, have actually lost the sense of gift. And the giftedness and the radical ability of God to do absolutely anything with your life. Like, besides levitation, which is well documented in the saints, you could do a number of different things in this room. You could do whatever it is that God chose to do in your mystery, just sitting there. And like, if we realize what, what we have to deal with, that even the bread and the wine that we even drink can become the body of Christ. And then all of a sudden, the world is really, it's like living in a, in a, in a tough little stem cells. So at any moment, you can do anything that God wanted them to do. You've absolutely no idea what the world is going to turn out into for you, what you're going to be asked to do. But it's, um, it's a lot more impressive than fairy land. The reality, truth is stranger than fiction, I would say. Because fiction is what we've limited ourselves to. Uh, and truth is what God allows us. So, yeah, I would say that's mostly. Playing with the world is mostly me trying to um, keep from becoming too grim around the mouth and, and believing lies that aren't actually satisfying in the first place about how dull the world is. Any last uh, questions or comments? Well, let's uh, thank Mr. Lippert for his presentation.